December 65, to present the work at the May 66 meeting. And that's why the first research is the second paper. We had some excellent questions, and those of you working in treatment get the same questions today. Will your patient have an overdose if they should take heroin? No, I've already told you the answer. What will methadone do to the liver? Well, I started prospective studies in 64 to address that question, despite the fact we discovered the very high prevalence then of Hep B, later Hepatitis Delta, and now Hepatitis C, we learned that persons without liver disease sustain no liver damage due to methadone. And how would these patients respond to pain? Well, they feel pain, they have pain, and they need to have medication for pain, usually a short-acting opiate superimposed. The next question, the one that I get so tired of hearing, came from a professor at UPenn, Isaac Starr, who said, and when do you plan to withdraw them from methadone? And Professor Dole simply said, and when do you plan to withdraw your diabetics from insulin? Or I could add your hypertensives from their needed medication, or your depressed patients from their needed medication? The answer is, when you, the physician, and the patient feels they're ready, with the possibility that you will have to reinstitute treatment. Now, for most persons with addiction, we know it's a chronic disease, and if you do not continue treatment, it is a chronic relapsing disease. This is not to say that everyone needs to stay in treatment. In the United States, however, we had a terrible episode in the late 70s where it was mandated that everyone come off methadone treatment. And the same would be true with buprenorphine. Well, 80% relapsed to illicit drug use within a year. 80%. And those who were able to stay abstinent usually were not truly abstinent. They started to use alcohol heavily, or benzodiazepines, or some licit drug of society. When somebody asks the question of when they're going to come off methadone or come off buprenorphine, mm. I will look at them very intently and say, why did you ask that question? <laughs> what problem do you have with treating addiction? And you can watch people start to squirm because then it all rolls out, be they a physician or a policymaker. Mm -hmm. You can take them down the line of, it costs to treat, ah, how much does it cost to go to prison? Mm -hmm. How much does it cost to treat AIDS or mm -hmm. Hep C or have a liver transplant? It costs to treat an addiction, nothing compared with societal costs, mm -hmm. healthcare and otherwise. You don't want to treat them because you think the medication is evil, the medication Good for chronic pain, evil for treatment of addiction. So what you're saying is you don't think addiction is a disease, and we come back to that. Mm. And remember our hypothesis of 64, that now is well proven that addictions mm. are diseases mm. of the brain with persistent and measurable changes in the brain. We didn't have the way to measure them, and we do now, and we do mm. it. You know, these are not fantasies or personality mm. disorders or criminal behaviors. But that needs to be taught, and it needs to be taught head on. I would start in every medical school, law school, nursing school, and social work school. Mm. Policymakers are funny worldwide. I have learned they do what they think their constituency wants them to do. Mm. They actually are very, very dependent mm. on mm. their constituency ideology. Mm. So once you can reach a policymaker who's really got strength, like the late Senator Kennedy, mm. whom I had the honor to know and interact with and help as he introduced parity mm. for treatment of addiction and mental health, mm. then you have a courageous person who will get up and say, what do you mean addictions aren't diseases? But it takes education. used a word here which I've always been unhappy about. He used the word substitute therapy and here in France, and I don't speak French, I keep saying ce n'est pas substitution, c'est replacement. Replacement, ce n'est pas substitution. And this is an important concept which we now have proof in humans as well as animals. A relative endorphin deficiency develops. Finally, Dr. Stead very well-known professor from Duke, said, and how much does it cost? 
and Vince said 15 cents for the methadone. Well, it's now 35 cents a day in U.S. and about 350 for the total package. Well, sadly, that's gone up to about 15 dollars, but 35 and 15, not too bad. Now, the research was so exciting that we decided that it needed to be taken to the field. A word that's popular in U.S. today, at least, is translational research. So the late Marie Nice Wander led the pack. She went down to the Manhattan General Hospital, which then was a proprietary hospital and later became part of the Bernstein Institute of Beth Israel. And with several, including Joyce Lowenson, she conducted a study. She first did a follow-up, which of the patients that we had admitted to Rockefeller and which we were all following up at Rockefeller. That's the first six subjects you see over the line. Six, you say, this will shock you, but our original research in 64 was accomplished with eight subjects. And three quarters of them, 75%, were still in treatment one year later. Marie admitted those below the line at the Manhattan General Hospital, and she had an opportunity to follow those only for one up to three months at the time this paper was written. But what she proved was what had happened in our very beautiful campus at the Rockefeller University with flowers and caring staff could be recapitulated in a very crowded rude, noisy, urban environment. A critical proof of principal extension. And in that uh, work, um, we uh, had also initiated prospective studies, which was my responsibility, to look at liver disease. And we found, as I've already told you, no problem with hepatotoxicity. But you can see that when we reported this study almost 10 years after people had been admitted, there was a very high retention. We find that this group of persons on moderately high, 80 to 120 for the most part, milligrams of methadone a day, who were in treatment for five years before they went in to medical maintenance under a practitioner, that about 5 to 10 percent of those ultimately decide they would like to see if they still need medication. And they are tapered very slowly off. And that group has essentially a 100 percent ability to stay abstinent. Now we are beginning to ask the question, are they genetically different? Does the brain heal with time? I suspect the brain does heal. And we've been able to prove that functions which are modulated normally by our endorphin system, become terribly disrupted during heroin addiction, and become normalized at different rates of time, but normalized during methadone treatment. In our rodent studies, we were able to show normalization with time, with no treatment after opiates or cocaine, but it takes much, much longer for the brain to normalize in these little rats and mice than it does to have caused the problem. So in humans, we might be talking about five or 10 or 15 years, and not just an abstinence one year in a residential community. And we know the, when residential communities finally, in many countries, were talked into with pressure often to do follow-up studies, they too found that 80% of their opiate addicts would relapse. And this has made many centers, even those that are originally committed to abstinence-based treatment, refer their patients to methadone or buprenorphine treatment off-site while they're undergoing counseling in the residential community. So I think the bottom line is, for most, probably lifelong, very long-term treatment. For some, may be able to come off and do very well. But the most tragic thing, and we did it to young people in the 70s, when we saw young people under 21 with years of heroin addiction come into treatment at age 15, 16, we thought surely they can come off sooner because their brain can't possibly be as badly altered. And parenthetically, we now know from our rodent studies, the adolescent exposed is much worse off than the adult exposed, much worse, with more persistence. But we didn't know that then. 
So we would taper these young people after a year.